Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Doug Holder, a prolific poet and writer who has an affinity for outcasts and a gift for helping people find their voice. Doug grew up in New York City and learned at an early age to appreciate immigrants, artists, and bohemians. When Doug moved to Boston in his 20s, he lived in a boarding house where he spent hours reading the work of Jack Kerouac and the Beats. Doug also wrote poems about the cast of characters in his building, which included quirky neighbors and an endless parade of prostitutes, barkeeps, and ne'er-do-wells. Doug gave voice to all of those people, just as he did a few years later when he started working as a counselor at the acclaimed McLean Hospital. Doug preserved the stories of people he met there, and he led a poetry group for patients so that they would feel empowered to write about their lives. Doug has helped thousands of poets and students as well. He is the founder of Ibbotson Street Press, co-founder of the Somerville News Writers Festival, and curator of the Newton Free Library Poetry Series. Doug teaches writing at Bunker Hill Community College and creative writing at Endicott College, where he runs a visiting author series. Doug has also recorded hundreds of audio and video interviews, many of which are archived at Harvard University and Buffalo University. Despite his busy schedule, Doug continues to write poetry about people who live on the fringes of society. His prose and poetry have been widely published in a variety of publications, such as the Boston Globe, the New Renaissance, Main Street Rag, and 96 Inc. Doug has published several books, and he has run poetry workshops and lectured across Israel. I'm happy to have Doug on the set with us today. Glad to be here, Elizabeth. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. You have a poem for us? Yes, I do. I, this is taken from my book, The Man in the Booth in the uh, Midtown Tunnel, um, pu published by the Savannah Bava Press in Somerville, Gloria Mindox Press. Anyway, I'll read it. Uh, the Man in the Booth in the Midtown Tunnel, and it has a little notation. As a kid, I always wondered about the man in the small booth in the middle of the Midtown Tunnel, the tunnel in New York City that goes from the borough of Queens to Manhattan. The cars stream under a frozen catatonic East River, and the man in the booth paces the perimeter of his cage. He fumes with the fumes and feels the river's pressure above his head, and he has lost his face long ago in a blue uniform, and the sun and the fresh air merely a hint, and we are faceless in a blur behind thick plates of light bleached glass, and we all remain ignorant of each other, and there is no light at the end of the Midtown Tunnel. Just an interesting note, Elizabeth. Uh, I used to go you know, from Long Island to New York, you know, from the suburbs to New York under the Midtown Tunnel, and I would always notice the man in the Midtown Tunnel. I said to my father, who was a very practical guy, you know, I said, you know, what do you think about that guy, Daddy? He's got a girlfriend, got a wife, got a family. You know, what kind of life does he lead? He says, how the hell do I know? He's a, you know, a guy in a booth. Mm -hmm. But that guy in the booth was an iconic figure to me. I guess I was always fascinated when you were talking about how these characters on the margins and things like that, that I always came back to them. So thus the title poem and the, you know, the, uh, the picture on the uh, front page of the, uh, the collection. I love the fact that in the picture, you are the man in the booth. Yeah, they photoshopped that and yeah, mm -hmm. they very skillfully did that. Because in many ways, you are like that man, except that for him, everything is a blur, but you see very clearly, and you give people the dignity and the color that they deserve, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That poem makes me think of some of your early influences, right. especially when you were a child in New York City. Your dad and your Uncle Dave helped shape who you are today. Would you tell us a little bit about them? Well, my, my dad was uh, you know, part of the greatest generation, a World War II veteran, and um, he, he worked in, after getting out of the Army, he worked in public relations and advertising, so he was very creative. Um, he wasn't necessarily a poet. 
but he was always writing and thinking up creative ideas and um, was a very voracious reader. My uncle Dave, um, my great uncle Dave, was um, uh, came from a long line of booksellers. They started out on the Lower East Side of New York. A lot of Jewish immigrants and other immigrants started out there, and they had things called push carts where they would sell books, you know, uh, by push carts. And eventually, he, this push cart um, um, a business grew into. Uh, he eventually owned a number of uh, rare bookshops, most notably the Carnegie Bookstore bookshop on Book Row in New York City near Carnegie Hall, and became a very prominent bookseller. So we were always getting books, you know, old books, you know, first editions, rare editions, and uh, our house was full of books, and um, I loved the smell, the, the feel, and loved reading them, and uh, it was just an always a presence in my, in my life. And I guess, you know, that atmosphere of old bookshops, I guess maybe where you were asking me how why do I like sort of dark and sort of slightly seedy and musty places? I guess it goes back to my childhood memories of, of books and old bookstores and the sort of muted light and all that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, sort of a seminal image, you know. As you were describing those two men in your life, I thought, oh, okay, that's where Doug's love of books and writing comes from. And that's where some of your affinity for so-called outcasts seems to stem from. What brought you to Boston? Because when you came to this area, you developed both of those attributes greatly. Well, you know, I also want to say that my father was a PR man, an advertising mm -hmm. man, so I think that part of me where I'm promoting people is, you know, and writing press releases and doing newspaper stuff is, is from my father also. Um, but where did that affinity grow from uh, for the outcast, as you were saying. And, well, I always had this conception of myself as, as living, as being an urban dweller. Um, and I was considering living in New York in a, in, a, in a small hotel outside of Washington Square with, you know, living the life as, you know, quote unquote, you know, an artist. And, um, but I realized that I didn't know if I had the fiber for it. I didn't think I could I think New York would have swallowed me up alive. Mm -hmm. So I thought of an alternative was Boston because I attended school here. I lived and I, you know, uh, for two years from 73 to 75 and then I moved to Buffalo and then came back in 78. Um, and, I, and I moved into, you know, more than just saying I want to live the artist life. I mean, I did think of that, but also I didn't have any money. So I had to get cheap digs. It was 38 bucks a week, bathroom down the hall type place. And, but it fit my whole conception of myself here I was you know a writer and you know even though I barely wrote anything I was keeping journals and things like that and and all and there were artists passing through and there were all kinds of strange characters in any rooming house you know there were there's always strange characters and uh, I lived there for a number of years from 78 to 83 and um, you know the cast of characters came through you know the all the service bartender who used to have all night poker games the yeah, we use this word, I know it's not politically correct, but I use it in my poems, a spinsterish woman who sort of like loses the look at me through the <laughs> crack in the door and then slam it. Um, there was a guy who just listened to opera all day, wore the same blue blazer for the last 30 years, and you know, he looked like a wild uh, conductor, you know, with his, you know, his hair flying all over the place. And I really never got to speak to him because he was very reclusive. And the retired Irish ser civil servant who, for instance, would would, would you know, hear him coughing his brains out during the night, and then it's, you know, I'd see him in the morning go, how are you, me lad, and everything going well, uh, how the top, you know. So you know, you, you, there was always these sort of um, public personas and private personas and people who were living sort of um, not the you know, typical American dream or the way the typical uh, we're brought up to believe we should live our lives or et cetera. So it was sort of an incubator for me, you know. And, um, I felt very comfortable there, uh, I, I, you know, and so, yeah, that's how I thought of it. So it just sort of, it sort of was a catalyst to something that was already there, maybe a bit latent, mm -hmm. but it, it just, you know, it just, it, that brought me out, you know, to, mm -hmm. uh, artistically, I thought. Mm -hmm. And it sounds as though that experience also helped you develop the compassion and the understanding that you needed to work with the patients at McLean. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think that that certainly helped. Um, 
I had an idea that I wanted to do that. Um, I worked originally in the South End in uh, Solomon Carter, where it was a DI, DYS facility and some very you know uh, tragic cases of kids who were involved in murders, and I used to take them back to Roxbury and things like that. And that, so I was working there, and that was inspiring me uh, to, to write about you know, people on the fringes. And then uh, some years later, I, I went to, I started McLean about four years later in 1982. So yeah, that was percolating. Um, but I, even as a kid, I always identified, you know, being, you know, like a sort of nerdy, unathletic, uh, awkward kid. Uh, I was always um, sort of, you know, um, on the margins in high school and things like that. And uh, so I think it started way back then, you know, of, yeah. of the sort of a feeling of, um, of alienation, you know, mm -hmm. very, you know, big, big, very. I grew up in a, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a community that was very high achieving, and um, you know, um, a lot of pressures and things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you led the poetry group at McLean, how did the patients react to that? Well, originally I came in well full of vim and vigor, and I read Allen Ginsberg's Howl. And I thought, oh, they would love that. And they said, the guy comes. I said, what do we have to hear this for? Mm -hmm. We live, you know, screaming, hysterical, naked down the Negro mm -hmm. streets at dawn. You know, I mean, says, well, you know, we don't need this. And I was surprised, but then it made sense to me. And then, um, and then I read a poem I remember once about um, chickens at a kosher butchery, and I wasn't. Uh, how they, and I wasn't, um, uh, didn't read the case histories of the patient, and one had an obsession with chickens. So when I started reading about this chicken being, you know, butchered or whatever, a butchered chicken or something in this kosher butchery, she got up, and started mm -hmm. crying, and left the room, and all the others followed. And my supervisor saying, "What the hell are you doing in there?" You know, and so you know, I, it evolved, and then eventually. Um, but you never know, like you know, it's not like uh, you know, an it's not like an Ivy League seminar there. You're with some very disturbed people, and you never know what's going to happen. One guy just suddenly out of nowhere threw a cup of coffee in my face, you know, because you know, he had some delusion about me. It wasn't fortunate, it was lukewarm. Um, I've seen other people really respond. They're, they're pretty much um, mute, and they don't say anything at all, and suddenly in poetry groups they've, uh, you know, um, sort of woke up, you know. Um, so, and, and, you know, and a lot of it, you know, a lot of the stuff they write is dog roll, but at least they're they're coming out of uh, their shells, and at least they're, you know, something addressing their spiritual side, uh, the side of the human, instead of being categorized as a patient, mental patient, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. So that's what is very valuable. Mm. How did the experience of working there shape you as a writer or a person? Well, you know, I wrote a, I wrote a small books of poems that was a, a pick of the month in a small press review. It was called the Poems of Boston and just beyond from the back bay to the back ward. Um, so I got a lot of my, I, you know, on a ward, you, you're writing notes about people, you know, mm -hmm. and I never use names because it's confidentiality, but you're writing people and you're closely observing them and you're interviewing them also to see how they're doing on a daily basis. So I think in that regard, um, um, a close observation and studying people, you know, as I would study anything else, a painting or whatever. Um, in that regard, it was, um, it was, uh, it was uh, educational. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm You made a comment in one of the email exchanges yeah, we yeah, had yeah. about wanting to capture the moment, the smell of a certain mm -hmm. restaurant or the sound on the street before it disappears. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that impulse to save the moment, how did that work when you were at McLean? Did you feel a difference in your impulses? To save the moment. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, uh, th there's the telling moments. For instance, I remember um, there was a woman, you know, uh, uh, a middle-aged woman who was, had all kinds of medications and was, you know, sort of way past a prime, looked like a mental patient. And there was this beautiful young mental health worker. Um, and she went to him and grabbed him. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was like she was trying to get something back. You know, um, uh, She just sort of hugged him and wouldn't let him go. And it was sort of like trying to get back of her, get back her, um, her life. And I, I mean, I thought moments like that are, very, mm -hmm. are, 
are very telling. Or for instance, a woman who was smoking a cigarette who was also had a sunken chest and no spirit in her. But and cigarettes are currency on, they used to be, you can't smoke on a ward on a psychiatric ward. So when she would smoke, Sonia, she would like, her chest would expand and she would be full and sort of like full of, full of life and things mm -hmm. like that. And um, so sort of give you an idea of the, um, of the, um, you know, the, of the pain and these telling moments. So yeah, and that, so I ca try to capture these moments. Oh, the time when I wasn't wearing uh, a badge identifying me as a worker, and once I was cleaning a table on a ward, and someone came up to me, a worker who didn't know me, who just knew it, and said, um, how you doing? Are you doing well? You're doing very good. You're doing very good. And I realized how patronizing people can be, you mm -hmm. know? And I, I was, the shoe was on the other foot, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, these, the, in that regard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you worked at McLean for since 1982, mm -hmm. on and off. And you were telling me earlier about the experience that sort of ended McLean as a full-time job for you, and how that ushered you into some new opportunities. Right. You know, I was pretty ensconced there. I had a very good job that was, you know, for what I did was pretty well paying and gave me all kinds of freedom and flexibility, a great boss, all that, you know, the ideal situation. I had that for eight years. Um, and I, I was good I had that because I was working on the inpatient wards for 20 years and it was starting to get to me as, you know, restraining people and all kinds of stuff like that. So this was good, you know. Um, and it ended and it just closed the pro one day they just said the program's closure out. But they did give us a good um, benefits uh, package and uh, for six months and then you can get unemployment. This was just when the recession was hitting, so they, uh -huh. they extended them. And during that time, I just didn't sit on my ass. You know, I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I started, um, you know, I started teaching because I knew guys and you know who were teachers at Bunker Hill and, and Endicott, and they liked me. And you know, I knew them in writers group. They liked my work and what I've done in the community. So I started teaching, and that opened up. It was very exciting for me, and I enjoyed teaching. And then I got a visiting author series there, and um, I would get paid to put out my magazine, a little money, you know, not getting rich, but, mm. you know. Um, and uh, so it's opened up a new life, you know, uh, in, in many regards, a new working life and a different, I mean, it's, you know, I know, you know, I say I always want to be on the margins, but it's always a kick when someone says, professor, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, me, mm -hmm. professor, you know. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's always a little, uh, Interesting, but I do enjoy working with kids, and uh, and um, you know it's nice to be recognized that uh, you know by some institutions that you you know you provide a valuable uh, service to the uh, literary community. So, mm -hmm. I'm amazed by the amount of work you were able to squeeze into one week because you review, you interview poets, you teach, you run a reading series. That's a lot of poetry. How do you maintain Doug the poet when you're doing all of that other work? To well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't know about you, but I, you know, because you have a very busy schedule as well. I, mm -hmm. I don't write as much as I used to. My own poetry, if I get a, you know, a poem, uh, you know, uh, every few months or something like that, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my own poetry. Um, um, I, I don't have as much time for my own work, but I do get more, uh, probably as much pleasure as interviewing people than I do as writing poetry and writing art, you know, journalistic pieces for the arts in, in Somerville. I write for this, I'm this arts editor for the, our local newspaper, the Somerville News. And, um, you know, I have a lot of stuff, you know, I compartmentalize my time. I have a lot of articles and archived, you know, to use in later days. So when I have free time, I do a whole bunch of interviews with people. You know, the reading series I schedule way in advance. In the summer, I have more time. Uh, you know, I do my lesson plans on certain, you know, I have coffee shops I go to before, or I go, I, I, like today, I was in my office at 6 o'clock at Endicott doing work for school. Um, and yeah, you gotta, you know, sometimes I'm stretching myself. Um, but I, you know, at this point, I just can't see something that I really, you know, would wanna give up. I just like doing it at all. Um, you know, I don't know, that might change. I, you know, I can't keep up this pace forever, but while I wanna do it, I, you know, I'm doing it, you know? Mm. What's most gratifying for you about helping people understand poetry through all those different venues? 
A lot of people come back to me um, in middle age, and, and they, they have been doing a job all these years, and they, they come back to poetry. And, you know, so I'm, I'm sort of like the gateway into the poetry world, in a sense. You know, you start out here, I'm very, you know, I'm, ver I'm very good with the beginners. I'm very good with young kids and or people who are coming. You know, when I say young kids, I mean, you know, the, teen the undergraduates and teenagers and people who are coming back to poetry or starting poetry again in retirement and things like When I taught at Newton Community Ed, I got a lot of folks like that. Um, and so I, I, it's gratifying for me. Some of them say, you know, you, you know, it's amazing to me. They say, oh, you know, you changed my life. You know, and <laughs> you know, just by writing poems. I mean, these people have had major careers and things like, oh, you know, this really, I mean, I've, I have a very prominent psychiatrist who is now in the bagel bars, and she came and said, Doug, you just changed my life, you know, and she just hugged me. And, and I, you know, it's amazing to me that, you know, I've, I, I get, that it's, it can be so powerful. But um, I think that's the most, when someone says that to you, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that you, you've helped someone in that regard. Um, and I'm always amazed that it's, you know, it's so, I guess, I guess because I do so much of it and, you, you know, you get so in the thick of it, how it can be. And even people are published, like, in, a, in small magazines or something like that. It's very exciting. It's some sort of, it's a great thrill from them, you know. Um, so in that regard, I think, you know, that's, just, that's probably the most gratifying in terms of what you're asking. Mm. Viewers are always interested to know how poets write and what their process is. Can you tell us a little bit about how you write a poem? Well, Elizabeth, I'm like a Western gunslinger. I don't know about you, because I, <laughs> I have like a, a little thing and I, I hear a snippet of conversation. I take out my thing, my little book there, and I start writing things down. And I'm always, you know, I'm always on the lookout, you know, um, because any, you know, any snippet of conversation, any strange uh, sight, um, I, I was reading something like, for instance, about um, a great hatred in a small room. I think it was a, a quote from um, um, Yeats or something like that. And then I just wrote it down because I was reading a book review. And then I wrote a poem about great hatred in a small room. Or um, uh, I was read an article or something about putting um, lipstick on a pig. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. And I got a great poem out of that. Or I heard someone say something. Or I, and so I'm always ready. It makes life an adventure, you know. And so that's my process. And then I'll go back to it um, and start filling out the poem, you know, start th thinking of images and connecting the dots. And, um, uh, and then I'll revise a few times. And um, I mean, the revision is always, you know, it's always, you know, the thing about poetry is that in talking process is that sometimes it just sounds great. You know, when you first write it, and you say, this is great. And then you wake up and you think it's a piece of garbage. You know, um, uh, you really have to work on it some more. So you really have to give yourself some distance. Um, so I try to do that too. Um, but like I say, you always got to have your, you know, ears and eyes open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We are getting near the end yeah. of our time, so I want to ask you one more question. Many of your poems are character studies. Right. Why does poetry work for you instead of, say, prose? What is it that a poem allows you to do that fiction or essays do not? Well, it doesn't take as long <laughs> to write a poem. <laughs> um, I think there's, an, you know, an, uh, that each word counts as we, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true. Um, each word counts in a poem. I mean, novel, you have a lot more words to, you, to work with. Um, you know, and you and you're able. You're really going for the essence of um, of something very. You know, sort of. It's it's sort of more um, a natural. It's almost instinctual poem, more than a novel was more um, thought out and uh, poem. Sometimes you know, you're, just, you're you're dealing with emotion, feeling. You know, and and in that way, I just feel it's it has a certain vitalness that uh, novels or fiction doesn't have. Mm-hmm. You've used the word essence and the word right. naturalness, and that is definitely how your work right. strikes yeah, me. Right. Not only your poetry, but the way you interview people, you as a host when you're leading a poetry reading. Well, I try to. You know, I'm not a. I'm not a. Uh, you know, I'm not a scholar or an intellectual. Or, um, but uh, I do think that I have. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very. Uh, you know. 
a motive, and and uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, I, I think I feel things, and that's how I deal with feelings. Um, uh, and and uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in the person also. So a lot of times I'll examine poems by um, examining the person. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that's how I am. I, you know, I'm not uh, you know, you know, textual analysis and all this stuff. I bit, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I, I like you know viewing the work on a very human level. Mm -hmm. Which is probably why students and people yeah. who don't know much about poetry like your work because it is something that's accessible mm -hmm. and it speaks to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you read another poem? Yeah, for yeah, us? sure, sure. I got. Uh, let's see. Oh, I was going to read the um, the, the sh since we're going into baseball season. I was going to read the, uh, the 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 baseball poem if I could find it here now. Oh God. Uh, well, uh, let's see. I'm sorry. Shea Stadium, 1972. The smell, the smell of cigar smoke reminded me old men gripping scorecards, the woodside, the woodside train a blur on the tracks to Flushing. The concession stands, pucks of hamburgers emerging from a sea of grease and onions. I sat high in the bleachers, still listening to the hard slap of Seaver's fastball, sneaking down to the depths for the boxes in a diamond glittering in a hot summer sun. Gawky and shambling, but here I was an Adonis of batting averages, strikeout stats. Here I was, graceful and smooth as an athlete. Nine innings played out with rules, final resolutions, perhaps poetic justice. And as A.G. circled the bases in his arrogant home run, home run strut, I wondered if my life would ever be so clear cut. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So. Looking back now, do you think your life is clear cut? Whose is? <laughs> mm. You know, that's what you think when you're that young. You think life's, you know, it's going to follow something. Yeah. Mm. But, well, thank you for your poems, your stories, and your insights. I right. know that a lot of people will hear what you say and really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Elizabeth. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay.